Native Americans First Nations of Reddit. What's something cool about your tribe's traditions and culture that outsiders might not know about? Hawaiian here. Like many native cultures we had no written language pre-contact. However the value of language itself was highly regarded, and the intricacies and poetic nature of our language was of utmost importance to our people. Anyway when English and the Roman alphabet was introduced to our people in the 18th and 19th centuries we basically ate it up. To have another way to express one's language was a huge deal. So much so that throughout the 19th century Hawaiians were literally the most literate in English and Hawaiian culture in the world with an adult literacy rate of over 90%. That's really amazing. I've been listening to a lot of Hawaiian history podcasts lately and this is a great piece of knowledge to learn about. Arish Nob, Ojibwa. We don't eat bear. It's a long story, with many reasons but the biggest for me is when they're skinned they look like people. It's eerie. I don't wanna read that. I'm part Odawa, more commonly known as a Tun. When a couple came together in marriage, they must choose about four sponsors. Sponsors are older, respected people who give the couple spiritual and marital advice. During the actual wedding ceremony, the sponsors make a commitment to help the couple. Sounds like a pretty good idea. I'm an East Coast native, Lumbi, and my people traditionally didn't live in teepees. We lived in wigwams longhouses. A lot of people don't know that. We didn't have the typical headdresses either. That generally was an out west thing. Your people live right over the state line from mine. I'm PD. I've had to explain to people that we don't and have never lived in teepees, too. I'm Anishnab Ojibwa Chippewa. Introducing yourself formally in Ojibwa requires a lot more information than in English or other languages as far as I know. When you're introducing yourself in Ojibwa the basic formatting is, Hello, how are you? They call me, my clan, referred to as a dogum. It's, I am from, my parents are called and, my grandparents are called and, I am winter moons old. The short form of this would just be your name, dogum, and where you are from. Also spirit names are a very real thing but you don't get to choose them and you've had your spirit name since before you were brought into this part of your spirit journey. It's believed that when you were brought into creation, the creator gave you a name so the spirits would know who you were. In the old days you would be taken to a naming ceremony with all of the children born around the same time as you and a medicine man or helper would perform a naming ceremony with sacred medicines and ask the spirits what your name is. However, now you would find someone when you are ready to perform a naming ceremony and ask them for help by presenting them with a red tobacco tie. The purpose of having a spirit name is to be closer to the spirits and creator and to help your spirit walk in the good way. This means that when you pray or dance or sing, or smudge the spirits will know it's you and be able to help you better when you need it. Not American, Australian. Hope that still counts. One thing we have is that after someone dies, we're not allowed to say their name for years. For example, after my grandfather died, my mum had to ask three years later for permission from my grandmother and other elders to his name on me. Recently, there was a death in the family with a fairly common name I've had to be mindful not to say it. I know plenty of other tidbits I'd be glad to share if anyone is interested. Whoa, that part about not saying the deceased's name sounds like a social minefield. Hearth, Navajo here. Some small things. 1. You don't have to say please or thank you in Navajo, like ever. Please pass the salt is not something that would likely happen, at least in old Navajo ways. I don't know if full assimilation into the dominant white polite culture has changed this for some people, but it certainly didn't with my father. The only situations where that'd be acceptable is if you're pleading for your life or your life was just saved. 2. Also saying I love you is pretty rare and, when said, extremely meaningful. In Navajo you literally mean what you say, and like in English, oh I love this diet coke or I love the new iPhone R. Ah. Again, things you would not say in Navajo. My dad's rule on saying that was always if it can't love you back, you shouldn't love it, and a creepy three. Owls are a bad omen. If you hear them say your name, you're done for. Have yet to ever hear of this happening, but you never know. There's lots of little stuff like that, which I also think depends on what region of the res people are from. 
Indigenous Australian here. Like most people we are very spiritual. One piece I think is interesting is that we have Baim or Sky Father who when carved or painted must be accompanied by his emissary or representative on earth. Kinda like the God and Jesus relationship. Weird. Nothing. My tribe is pretty much in ruins. Recently found out I might be part their poor instead of my crappy little tribe so I may actually get free college now. In my culture there is no word for goodbye. We only say see you later because we don't believe in not seeing each other again. Also it's disrespectful to make eye contact or stare into the eyes of elders. It's extremely frowned upon to say no to an elder or not ask them if they need help. Women of my tribe are leaders in our communities and men are historically the providers. Even now women will begin protest of an issue and the men will follow to protect the women. My mother told me the reason Navajos had skinwalkers a long time ago was to defend us from other tribes and conquistadors. When she was a kid her cousin found full Spaniard amur and a sword in a cave but was told told to put it back. So there's probably a lot of cool crap buried everywhere but probably won't ever be found or touched. Comma full Spaniard Dharma. Not gonna lie. Probably a skeleton too. Cree here. I was taught when you think a spirit is trying to enter your house you either ignore it or yell at it angrily to get out. Tons of times the front door has opened by itself, an indication of a spirit trying to enter your home. And I've heard people yell get the heck out. One isn't supposed to acknowledge the spirit or get all excited about it, otherwise you're inviting it into your life. Also owls are a bad omen. I was told not to play outside as a kid or else an owl will swoop down and put you in its war and take you away. So it was especially creepy when I watched the fourth kind for the first time. I've got tons more stories if people are interested. Yes, we are interested. In the Tilawa tribe you would have to chase an elk down on foot, with nothing but a knife. Until it passed out from exhaustion then kill it and deliver it to your grandfather elder you are close to in order to prove yourself. As a Blackfoot member I can say that we are one first nations that has held on to the ancient. We still have our sun dances and ceremonies. The sacred bundles that are used and passed down from members are so old that nobody know exactly their age. These ancient ceremonies usually happen in the summer time around August. It goes back to when we would prepare for the harsh winters. Lots of praying and hunting and gathering. I'm just so amazed at how my people have survived through the government's way of colonizing our people. And we still managed to save our culture. The language is a different story though. I fear if we lose our language we will lose our ways. The Menominee are called the men of the Great Lakes. We were traders and our traditional food crop was wild rice. We still plant beds of wild rice each year. Oh and minus 10 is considered a brisk spring morning. Our traditional food crop was wild rice. Thank you for my favorite food. Nobody knows how to really prepare it down here in AZ. Former Minnesotan here. Also, till the namesake of Menomone Falls, Wisconsin. Cool. Mi'kmaq here. Never heard of it. Eastern Shore. Canada there's few of us left. 1. Natives and French people are incredibly racist. History says we used to be allies against the English. Because there's few of us. It's almost a given you are related so date outside the language or go white. Unlike most tribes, we'll kill any animal. With great respect. Unless albino. Albino are spirit animals. Everyone has spirit guides. And names. Given to you in a vision either by baptism from a shaman. Sweat lodge. Shaking tent. Or sun dance. Limited to men. Where there's hooks tied to a pole in their backs. They stay that for 3 days without food. You are normally limited to one spirit animal, that come with certain traits, like fearlessness, wolf, loyalty to family bear, etc. My daughter is white black bear and was given two spirit animals, brown bear and polar bear, which is cool. You know it's a small tribe when you have to go this far down to find another Mi'kmaq. I've read that our tribe is credited with creating the original hockey stick which I find neat. I'm not full-blooded or very close with tribal practices but I have a tremendous amount of respect for the spirituality and kindness I've seen from my Mi'kmaq family over the years. They are pretty amazing. I'm Chickasaw. Our nation's motto is, unconquered and unconquerable, because we have never lost a battle against the United States. We also own the largest casino outside of Vegas. Our people are so well taken care of. I love being part of the nation. 
full Navajo here. However, since I was raised non-traditional in the city of Phoenix, I am unfamiliar with all of our culture's traditions. I know snakes are considered bad luck. I have also heard to avoid crossing a coyote's path. Additionally, my sister told me to never accept a stranded animal from the street into my home due to the possibility of it being a skinwalker. I am also not allowed to discuss those either, since it provokes them onto me. Oh crap. I'm always picking up strays and taking care of them. Hey, guess I'll have to chance it then. Full-blooded Cree here. I don't have anything I can contribute since I'm not in touch with my culture, but it makes me happy to see that some people are curious about native people. It's like, wow, someone's actually interested in us. Wow people are actually interested in us. Full-blooded Navajo here. I don't know what to tell you all but if someone asks me a question I'll gladly answer. Our chief's name is Gary Batten. When I first applied for recognition of my heritage I don't know what else I expected our chief's name to be but Chief Gary doesn't quite sound right. That reminds me of when I took karate classes when I was a kid. I was so disappointed that our sensei was named Harry. I wanted something cooler. I am an Anishinaab, Ojibwa. I participate heavily in the indigenous community at my school. Being in southwestern Ontario, Canada, there are many different tribes and clans that exist here. The acceptance is absolutely amazing. Having been through our own instances of discrimination and trauma, we are very accepting and open to listening about the many stories that people have to share. I was not too aware of my culture before university. Dad was native. Mom is not. Grew up with mom. But something I learned that gave me a huge perspective on religion and spirituality is that our creation stories are consistent with those of Christianity, Islam, Edit, probably many religions. But I am ignorant to most due to relative lack of education in theology. Our creation story, look up Turtle Island, says that says the earth was flooded as a restoration technique, and that is consistent with the early depictions of other religions as well. Being native, I feel a huge connectedness to people who'd share my culture, but I also feel a newfound appreciation for people who don't share the same views that I have, because, we really are all made from the same cloth. The flooding trope is also present in Germanic paganism's end times renewal, Ragnarok, for the same reason, to purge the world and start anew. In a clear, we don't get much eye contact to elders when we are having a conversation. It is considered to be very rude. Also, when the elders are speaking, young people should listen. Asking for something you want is also rude. It's best if we enjoy something together instead. We do not really greet each other like hello or bye. We just smile at each other. The Eskimo kiss is kind of true. But we don't kiss nose to nose. We kiss nose to cheek. We also kiss their lips. But we do not hunt animals just for its furs. We highly respect animals and thank the animals we hunted and don't waste anything from the animal and try to use everything what the animal had. It's a tradition to name your child after someone that has passed away or a widow who lost her husband and gender doesn't matter. A baby girl can be named from a man that died recently to carry on the spirit. Also, we do not live in igloos. Finally a question I can answer. Cheyenne Rivers you here. Don't ever think skinwalkers are something to joke about. We don't like those things and even just saying the word is terrifying. My non-native girlfriend loves to talk about skinwalkers and doesn't understand why I always change the subject. Even as a Choctaw I know it's nothing to frick with. Northwest native here. Quack quack quack. Most northern coast nations kept and traded slaves from rival villages. Ritual cannibalism was a thing as well. My great grandfather was Cherokee. In his tribe, if somebody got burnt by something, he would say a chant, blow on the person's burn, whisper, and tap it with his fingers. This would make any pain go away. My grandmother told me about it but I didn't believe her. So, like dumbass kids often do, I spilled some hot water on my hands when I was making instant noodles. Grandma came in, whispers at my fingers and blew on them, tapped them a few times, and the pain was gone. I like science. I really do. I think it's a thing. I really don't understand how it works or what kind of weird wizardry was going on. I saw her do it again when my aunt got sunburn on her shoulders. 
I asked her to teach me, but you can only teach it from man to woman down a generation. So my great grandfather taught her, so she has to teach a male in the family. I'm a girl so she can't teach me. Colon really the only time I ever considered sex changing so I could learn Bernie Fixie chant. She teaches your uncle or dad or something similar. They teach you. Anishinaab from the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Indians. We live on the best area for wild rice. The crap you buy in the store is garbage compared to the mandarin. Wild rice. That grows on our lands. It's a very important food for our people and is actually the reason why our people migrated here thousands of years ago. Lakota on and Deja wind out here. Raised mostly Lakota. In the Lakota language men and women speak different dialects of the language. The endings and beginnings of sentences are changed based on one's gender. Also words change a lot because of context. Half Cree here. I've noticed a lot of negativity getting upvoted, so I'll continue that train. Everyone is racist. I grew up secretly proud I looked whiter than my family because all the good guys on TV were white. Then I got older and felt ashamed that I didn't look how I felt on the inside. I've been made fun of for being too white by First Nations people, including family when I was younger. However, the amount of times white people have started saying some really hateful crap before they realized I am First Nations and then tried to backpedal is astounding. They would say things like oh, but you're cool bro, must be your other half frick off, you ignorant savage, I don't want to know you anymore. Too white to be friends with natives, too native to be friends with whites, catholic school sucked. I'm not aboriginal, 100% old world origin. But one thing a lot of people don't know about is that a lot of nations had cold forging of copper. Copper in Yawit and Hyder to name a few. And I've heard of peoples in South America that even hot forged, aboriginals were not locked in a stone age. Hot forged copper is present in the archaeology of the southwest, particularly Charco Canyon, having been imported from Mesoamerica. It was imported in raw form and also shaped into bells. In Upiak here, we do live in igloos, or the traditional way of spelling it, igloo, which originally meant house or dwelling. The snow house was actually called a puiayak. I'm Oneida and some of the cool things I would say is the food. We have some amazing food. Another is at funerals we have singers and drummers sing in our native tongue. Randomness but we don't drink after funerals like most people. We go and have a feast in honor of the passing. The women who cook are always the first to eat followed by the grandmother's elders. Only after they have been seated do we get in line. I have been to military dinners who didn't show as much respect. It's a sight to see. Every family has their own corn soup, fry bread, and chili that no one shares. Each different but the same in many ways. Mine is different from my aunt and she's the one who taught me to cook. She won't show me how to make corn soup. Said I'm too young yet. I'm 27. Paternal grandfather was Mescalero Apache. My dad has tribal membership, but my brothers and I never replied. Seemed wrong, since we don't even live in the same state as the tribe. We obviously didn't grow up in the tribe, so I can't comment on those intra-tribal things. But when I was younger my dad and I did a lot of research into the history of the tribe. There's several cool things about them. First being that the name Apache means enemy in Hopi or Zuni. Can't remember which right now. Second is that the Apache peoples are actually migrants from the Pacific Northwest area and rather latecomers to the Southwest region. And the language family, Nardine, stretches from the deserts of New Mexico and Arizona up to Canada and Alaska. Pretty dang cool if you ask me. White Mountain Apache here from Y Tribe AZ. I found it fascinating that we never learned anything about any other Apache tribes but our own. I was always curious about our cousins but it was never really brought up, except Geronimo. I saw a burial ceremony once but it was not done by my tribe. It was when my best friend's mother died and we were all very close so I participated. From my understanding it was a native ritual that had been mixed with Catholicism over the years. They beat a drumbeat with the family of the lost relative and start to fire. Earlier in the day, they had drawn out her spirit through a ceremony and through expressing their grief. They then circle the fire dropping in bits of tobacco. As they drop in the tobacco they talk about all the great things the person did. Then the family sits and everyone in the community comes. 
Everyone takes some tobacco and circles the fire, dropping it in while thinking about the good things she had done. As this happens the drumbeat builds stronger. It was explained to me that everyone dropping in tobacco is building a bridge, or maybe a circular staircase, to the next life. It was one of the most beautiful things and I hope I am honored in such a way when I die. I was very young and I know I've forgotten a bunch of other things but no other details are coming to mind right now. I feel like I remember a few rounds in a sweat lodge but do not know if it was before or after. Or if I'm mixing memories. I remember the fire and being able to feel the staircase like it was in the air in front of me. Like all that love had solid form. Held together by all the great things she had done and the drum. My tribal elders still tell of stories when the United States Army handed out blankets from a local hospital full of smallpox blankets as peace offerings that were used by smallpox victims at said hospital. Heck my tribe was relocated in the middle of nowhere and the United States government put a fort up right next to it to keep my ancestors in line. Good times, good times. So not much to share. My tribe does run one of the most successful casinos in our region of the United States and donates millions every year to our all cities within 50 mile radius of our tribe to their local police, fire, medical, schools and road infrastructure departments. Dot. My grandmother was Micmac. Sexual and physical abuse back in her day was rampant on the res. But to be native and caught out of the res could also be just as horrible. To escape. As a young lady, she dyed her hair to look passing white. She was a bit fair skinned. I never knew Canada's dark history with abuse and such. 50s onward, where kids were just taken from their families, maybe put into Catholic homes or foster homes. It's shocking and it had kept very hush hush. Missing sisters is still a huge and depressing fact, but the government really doesn't help much. The cycling abuse can be just horrid. It's not cool but it needs to be out there more. It's not fair to have it swept under the rug. Also forgot this. Our people had stories of ice giants or giants that lived up in the cold and also small forest people. I've always thought that was really neat. Where do those tales originate from? What did the elders see long ago? I personally get annoyed when that one white person has to tell me how they are 1 stroke 500 native. They normally interrupt me when they say that. I've got a bit of everything. I'm mostly black Irish. Have some native in me, got a tiny bit of African. When people ask me, I say I'm a white American. You can't be one stroke eight German damn it. I'm mostly Cheyenne. The amount of violence in my ancestry is astounding. Nobody believes me when I talk about the history of the Cheyenne tribes. They would get into huge fights with other native tribes that accepted settlements from the white man. Very fascinating history. Honestly, I didn't know much about my ancestry until quite recently, though, so I'm still in learning things. Ojibwa here. Boarding schools were a huge problem in our area. I'm in Wisconsin. Native children were taken from their families. Parents didn't have the legal right to choose where their child was educated, and were not allowed to return home. They were punished for speaking Ojibwa to each other and so could only speak English. In my family apart from a few older cousins who have made a deliberate effort to learn it the language died out abruptly two generations ago when the majority of our parents and grandparents were placed in these schools. There are now quite a lot of efforts in schools across the state to teach the language and prevent it from dying completely, which I think is pretty cool. You can now take classes in high school or college in a language the government had not too long ago been deliberately trying to wipe out. Same deal with the residential schools north of the border. I think the resurgence of indigenous languages is pretty amazing. This is actually bulls and not cool but I am posting IT anyways. I am one stroke four Native American through my father. My father is a lazy drug addict who did not register on the tribe's roll. Due to his laziness I can not register. Even though blood doesn't lie and his parents were registered. I'd take a freaking DNA ancestry test for that card if they asked but the tribe is indifferent. Chief standing near of the Ponca Trine I belong to was the first to take the government to court and get Native Americans recognized as human beings. Dane ZAA, or Beaver First Nations here, it is considered very bad to whistle or hiss at the northern lights. Also, my grandmother was able to kill a trapped rabbit by massaging its heart, so that's pretty cool. 
In tradition of the Sami people of northern Scandinavia you shouldn't whistle at the northern lights, because it will disappear and a horrible demon called Stalo will come and take you. Canada BC. Tsekheen. People of the rocks. My family lineage has always had men that were great trackers and hunters. Myself excluded as we decided I'd be the first to go to university. Though I was trapping and spending up to two weeks in the bush by the time I was 10. My father and grandfather would also say an old prayer thanking the creator for whichever animal they caught. Tobacco and a some dakel. My wife is actually a full blown US citizen. Florida. Her family is fun when it comes to the hundred questions. Also the elders in my community still speak Dakel strictly when speaking to other elders. It is however a dying language as the young show little to no interest. I'm half Miwok half Pomo. Indians are super racist against everyone else, even other tribes. I know a lot of my family don't like people from the big tribes like Navajo or Cherokee because they aren't really native most of the time. Also we have this thing where strawberries are cursed if you don't eat them after the strawberry festival. Once a year we gather for our tribes, Ho-Chunk, general council to vote on different issues ranging from removing a president to changing our Christmas payout. It is the one time I get to see a lot of my family in one place, and it is interesting to see in a smaller population how your vote actually counts in the big picture. I'm half Ho-Chunk and half Chippaway but I never knew my dad's side of the family. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. Bye for now.